Well, good afternoon and, and welcome back from the break. Um, I'm Philip Booth and I'm Director of Research and Public Engagement at St Mary's University Twickenham and Senior Academic Fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Vernon Smith. Um, Vernon is one of 13 Nobel Prize winners who have been involved in some way with the Institute of Economic Affairs, but I think is the first one we've had to speak at Think. Um, so delighted that he's been uh, able to come over and be with us uh, this afternoon. Vernon's academic career started back in 1955, and he rapidly rose in academic stature as he developed the discipline of experimental economics, which moves away from the whiteboard or blackboard, as it was, would have been called then, and looks at how real people actually operate in markets and real-life situations. As another Nobel Prize winner, Ronald Coase, once said, although actually quoting somebody else, if economists wish to study the horse, they wouldn't go and look at horses. They'd sit in their studies and say to themselves, what would I do if I were a horse? <laughs> and um, Vernon Smith does exactly the opposite uh, of that. And for the development of that field of research, in 2002, Vernon won the Nobel Prize for Economics, along with Daniel Kahneman, whose work was very influential um, in behavioural economics, uh, about which you heard uh, this morning. So, welcome, Vernon. Oh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and, 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 and let me, ju let me just say that at my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. <laughs> but, but I particularly liked being, uh, being, having been invited by the IEA because John Blundell, I knew him yep. for about oh, 30 years, mm -hmm. so closer to 40 years, mm -hmm. and this was his gift to me on the occasion of the uh, Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. it's, he knew I liked bolo ties, being from Arizona at the time, and he created one with Adam Smith on it. So. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, it's sterling silver as well. It's a, it's a very fine um, uh, piece of, uh, p uh, very fine tie. Um, I'd actually like to start with the uh, Nobel Prize and, and ask you um, what happened when you won the prize? How did you find out and, and then how did it change your life afterwards? Well, I was in my office at George Mason University. I usually would get into the office about 6.30 at se or 7. I was writing a paper and the call came in, I, as I recall, it, it, it came in around 8.30 but they thought I was on the Fairfax campus, not the Arlington campus. And so uh, a lot of people around GMU knew about it before I did, mm -hmm. because, it, what, what, because when Stockholm was calling Fairfax, mm -hmm. everyone knew what that was about. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, and I, I answered the phone, and the chairman of the economics committee uh, spoke. Uh, he said, I'm here with the with the entire prize committee mm -hmm. sitting here on the speaker phone. Uh, he read the citation uh, for me and he asked me how I felt. I said, with great, great relief, because my friends have been predicting this for years and I always felt I was letting them down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it started. Right. <laughs> And then what happened in the following two years? I take it life became well, pretty, bu pretty busy, did it? Well, actually, I was... Uh, <laughs> see, the, the main effect on... The immediate effect on my life is that I couldn't accept all the invitations. Mm. I had already been doing a lot of traveling and lecturing in connection with my, with my research, and so I was on the road pretty regularly. Uh, the difference is that now I got to meet presidents, <laughs> and people that I would never in the world have had an opportunity or chance mm -hmm. to, uh, 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 to, meet, to meet before. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and incredible trips to Mexico and China that I still treasure very much, mm -hmm. uh, uh, th those experiences. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about the early experiments that you did in the, in the classroom Back in 1955, right at the beginning of your academic career. Yes, it was the beginning of my academic career. And I realized that I didn't really know anything about the, the connection between theory, supply, particularly supply and demand theory, because I was teaching uh, principles, and kind of what people actually do on the ground. 
And so I came up with an experiment. And I decided I would run it in my class the very first day in the, in the winter, winter semester, the, the second semester I was there. So I ran, I had a class of 22, and I ran an, 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 an experiment before they had read any economics and knew anything about it. And I thought what I was going to do is to show that this market wouldn't work the way we, believe, we often uh, talked about markets. Uh, why should I believe that markets work? I, my mother was a socialist and I had a Harvard education. You know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what's very interesting, and, and the, here's the market that I created. I gave, uh, half the class were buyers, half the class were sellers, and I gave values to the buyers and they made money they made the difference between the value I assigned them and the price they paid in the market. So they were motivated to buy low. Sellers got the difference between their value for a unit they already owned and the price in the market, so they were motivated to sell high. And I organized the market as a continuous oral outcry double auction, a bid-ask market. Or, okay, that was the setup. And we ran a series of repeat periods, like Monday's market and then Tuesday and Wednesday, so forth. And these were very short markets, about six minutes or so. That market converged very quickly to the equilibrium. Well, uh, what was widely taught and believed among economists was that uh, 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 competitive market theory was an abstract ideal. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get it unless people had complete information on supply and demand. All right, in my market, and each individual only knew what the, he or she was willing to pay uh, for a unit based upon their own private value or willing, willing to sell. So no one had complete information. Each person had only a very tiny fraction uh, of the total. And also we believed you had to have large numbers and we taught that, and we believed that people all, all had to be price takers. Okay, small and, and, and relative to total. Well, in this market, everybody was making price as much as they were taking, and it converged quickly to the equilibrium. At the time, there was only one economist that was writing that could explain what happened in that market, and it was Hayek. Mm -hmm. Because what did, he, what did he write about? He said, the, the pricing system is, first of all, it's an information system. And it, give, it allows each person through prices to take the right action without anyone having to tell him what to do. That's exactly what was happening in my class. Nobody was telling these <laughs> participants what to do they were taking an action which led to, to an efficient outcome together as each was trying to maximize his own gains. What they did was maximize the gains for the, for the entire group. Mm -hmm. So it, <clears throat> that got me hooked on what became known as experimental economics. And believe me, I never, in, never set out to, to create a new field in mm -hmm. economics. And then this work developed and, and led to a whole range of contributions. Uh, electricity oh. markets in New Zealand and Australia, and most recently housing bubbles, is that right? Oh, oh yes, yes, and mo uh, most very exciting, the work we did, first in this country on the, in connection with the deregulation of gas, mm -hmm. pipeline networks, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And then we went to, uh, uh, we were involved in New Zealand and Australia in the privatization of electric, of electric power. Or, or the liberalization of it. A lot of those assets were still publicly owned, but the point is they had to live with the prices they got in the markets. And, and that was particularly exciting. And, and let me, those of you who are studying economics and are studying mathematics, learn it and learn it well because, because there's uses for that in the design of new kinds of markets. And because we, we in our applications, you see, particularly in electric power, the, the technical work that, that uh, needed to have, you see, the, the work we did in creating those markets 
as background and needed that technical information, you see. And, and the problem of, of finding uh, optimal outcomes in a complicated system, you see, mathematically, and then let's see if, if decentralized agents can find that without, you see, any, any central direction at all. So those comparisons are, are very important. Um, well, you've already mentioned your namesake, uh, Adam Smith, and um, uh, you've got a very strong admiration for, for Adam Smith. Many of the students here will be familiar with, uh, if not uh, read, um, The Wealth of Nations. What, what do you think is Adam Smith's most important book, or what would you recommend uh, well, that they I, take from I, Adam Smith? Well, I think Adam Smith's most important book is the one that he thought was his, the most important book, and that's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. That was his first book. And there's plenty of evidence to indicate that Adam Smith saw that as, as the most important book. See, see, the problem is he wrote a spectacularly popular book that was read by statesmen when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. Uh, uh, William Pitt the Younger, who was prime minister uh, in Great Britain for over 18 years, thoroughly understood the wealth of nations. And Adam Smith, in fact, himself once commented after he met uh, William Pitt the Younger and had a chance to talk with him, he says, Mr. Pitt is a remarkable person. He understands my system better than I do. But you see, that gives you an idea. He had an immediate impact upon mm -hmm. thinking and policy. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, and his views on, in, uh, you know, Adam Smith uh, uh, opposed slavery, colonial uh, uh, empire, colonialism, taxation without representation. These were ideas that were not popular at the time, you see, but eventually became, those ideas had a prevision of what Great Britain would become, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> And uh, also, well, Adam Smith, of course, is widely credited for promoting the intellectual case for, for free trade. And you've recently commented on President uh, Trump's trade policy, uh, saying, I believe, uh, Mr. Trump, your proposal can't work. It's bad economics and bad politics. A steel tariff will do great harm to the US economy. Tell your constituency that you serve them as best you could and back off. Do you fear for the future of um, free trade in the world as developed so successfully over the last 20 or 30 years? Well, you know, right now it's in chaos. That is, the, the, the policy debate is. And, and uh, I don't believe Trump has any notion of kind of where this is going. But his, you know, he, he's a showman and he sees... Uh, he sees distortions and inefficiencies that are coming, and also he sees some harm in that to um, uh, some of his American uh, constituencies uh, in tariffs. Uh, but I think this, you see, out of this chaos, it's important that organizations like IEA, you see, be able to make proposals that can uh, enable all countries to reduce their tariffs, mm -hmm. and all these distortions between, mm -hmm. uh, to be reduced, because that's, that's where we can get the most gains from trade, and each country actually has an interest in doing that mm -hmm. if we can get the other ones to do it. Mm -hmm. So, you see, it seems to me that uh, don't listen to the tweets, mm -hmm. uh, be prepared to, to offer a solid mm -hmm. plan. And if, you know, obviously the UK will have control of its own trade policy after Brexit. Um, do you think if the UK cannot bilaterally or multilaterally negotiate reductions in tariffs, it should just unilaterally um, remove tariffs? Do you think that's the best strategy? Uh, I, I, well, it, it's politically very difficult. But no, I think that's, you, you would get benefits from mm -hmm. that. And I think that, uh, you, you know, and I, and I think you're going to, uh, in the long run, benefit from being, from being out of the, uh, the union. And it, it, may be, it may be difficult to chart a clear path to a better world. But, you know, as Hayek used to say, the British are good at muddling through. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, you, you can muddle through if you're outside 
mm -hmm. of the union. If you're in, it's going to be very hard to muddle through, okay, mm -hmm. because then you have all those constraints. So mm -hmm. I think you're, you're at an advantage. Okay. My only regret is, of course, the reasons why it came about. There's this groundswell of, mm -hmm. of opposition to immigration. Yeah. And, of mm -hmm. course, I've always been very strong in favor of free movement of peoples as well as a free movement of goods and goods and mm -hmm. services. And that's been a painful thing. I, I was at the University of Arizona for 26 years, and we had a leaky border all of that early, those early years, and nobody much cared, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, 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 people with with trade skills, particularly in the building industry, would come across the border mm -hmm. if you wanted a good bricklayer, a mason, mm -hmm. and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. you, you, you hire an illegal alien. Mm -hmm. They send money home. They go back home. Mm -hmm. You see, they're back and forth. Mm -hmm. Now you can't do that. Mm -hmm. If you get in, you can't get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You see. And so, uh, and, and that really, uh, and our border in America, America is a was a problem before Trump came simply because of the violence due to the drug wars. Mm -hmm. You see, there, yeah. there's a, an, another spectacular example. We learned in, in America that probation al of alcohol didn't work. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if people wouldn't maybe drink so much, but on the other hand, to, to prohibit it, we did far more harm than good, mm -hmm. you see. And that became so obvious that actually re we repealed a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment, and that takes a lot of, mm -hmm. that's very hard to do in the American yeah. system, you mm -hmm. see, that's how bad it was. But we didn't apply that less lesson mm -hmm. to, the, to, to drugs, mm -hmm. and uh, of course we, we prohibited drugs, and then we can't control our demand, and we can control supply within mm -hmm. the United States, so the supply is coming from outside, and that creates all this border violence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I'd now like to open up to the audience. It's your chance to ask Vernon any questions uh, you'd like to ask. Already quite a few hands. Yep, gentleman at the front, you were first. And then the uh, lady, is it, or gentleman, uh, with, with the, the one dressed in black. I can't see because it's, da it's, da it's dark in front of me and, and I'm in a spotlight. But uh, the... Um, Go ahead. Uh, hi there. Thank you very much, Vernon. Um, just a small question. You mentioned Hayek, but are there any uh, economists, either who have passed away a long time ago or re more recent times, who you've really seen influence your academic work? I'm sorry, what, what was that? Are there any economists who have really influenced your academic work? Oh, the economists that influenced me. Well, I think at Harvard, the economists that influenced me most were Vasily Leontiev. I wrote my thesis under him, but also Gottfried Hobbler. And that's an interesting because Hobbler was, came out of the Austrian mm -hmm. tradition. I, I can't really say I became an Austrian economic, uh, uh, Austrian economist, but I certainly was influenced that, that. And I was very much influenced by, by Leontief's uh, concern for empirical verification or f falsification of, of uh, of hypotheses, and and so that that was an important and and then, in uh, I was also I found Irving Fisher, a very uh, valuable uh, contributor to economics, and in spite of his fa failure to in 1929 to, <laughs> uh, to forecast the the stock markets, but but economists you know we should stay completely out of the business that business we know nothing about that and are just likely to get ego on our face, but he wrote. Uh, uh, you see, Fisher wrote about 1933 a, a great paper on the debt deflation, deflation theory of recession, which tells you a lot about uh, why the, the Great Depression was so serious, and also it, it kind of leads in, it helped us, to, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Steve Gerstad understand in the Great Recession the importance of housing. You see, in both of those collapses, because when you have when you have a commodity 
When, when you are buying a, a good so durable it lasts maybe 75 to 100 years, and you're buying it mostly with other people's money, okay, with mortgage credit, uh, you're talking about a system becoming very vulnerable to downside risk in the price of that asset. Because when, when the price of that asset falls, it falls against fixed debt and equity has hit very, very quickly. Equity is wiped out. And most, of, most people, most households, their wealth is in, the, in their home. It's not in the stock market. And so that process is very different than a decline in prices in the stock market because there it's not long-term debt. It's, it, it's short-term debt and, and those loans are callable. You see, if, if you have a portfolio of stocks and the, and the prices start down, your broker asks you to put up more cash. And if you don't do it, he can sell you out. So that means that when stock market uh, prices fall, the debt falls with it. And so balance sheets are cleaned up day to day. There's no hangover. Whereas when housing prices fall, it's against fixed debt. And that all comes out of equity. And it, in the stock market, it's over when it's over, okay? But in housing markets, the, the pain has just begun. It's not over just because the prices have stopped falling because households are now in negative equity. And, and that can be painful for a very, very long time. And I don't know why that simple concept, a lot of my colleagues in economics don't get it, okay? Please, you get it. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the no at the, in the middle, in front of the camera. Here, here's the mic. Uh, second row. Okay. Second row. That's it. Yeah. No, no, to the right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, you were talking about the um, kind of constitutional amendments in the U.S., and I was wondering your perspective on guns and perhaps the economic um, implications if they were to be banned, even though that would probably not occur. The banning of guns. What, what's that? Um, what do you think the implication, the economic implications would be of the banning of guns? Oh, the banning of guns. Mm. Uh, well, there's a huge floating inventory of guns in the United States, all over the place, okay? And it's not going to touch those. It's, gonna ban, it's simply going to ban the production of new guns. So that's, that's the flow into that stock is all you're, you're, you're changing. That stock is still available, and it will become more more uh, valuable. You see, to protect those guns, and 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 the people willing to pay the most for those guns are the people not likely to use them in ways that you think is good are good. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the gentleman at the front. Hi there. I I remember seeing on TV the other day, President Trump said, "I want free but fair trade." Do you think that's possible in any way? I mean, I know there's like the whole fair trade movement, there's a cooperative movement, there's the micro-loans um, system which is designed to encourage entrepreneurship. But I, but I can't see how, especially with the whole tariffs thing, free and fair trade is possible, or if they even go together as a concept. I'm sorry, I had a little... Yeah, okay. Um, is President Trump really... Um, is his aim ultimately really free and fair trade, as he tries to suggest? Oh. Yes, we should, believe, uh, uh, we should believe that rhetoric and be ready for a plan that can achieve that through a, a, a multilateral reduction of tariffs. And I think the, uh, that's what the IEA plans to do. And I'm sure Cato and Mercatus Center and places in the United States are working on that same, same issue. Yes. But do you think he really wants um, that? I mean, are, are, the, are the tariffs... Uh, well, smoke screen and he really wants tariffs, or is he look, trying to get himself to... Uh... Uh, um, I, I don't know what he wants. Right, you know, okay. It's very hard to figure <laughs> out. I do not know. Good yeah. luck on that one. Yeah, okay. uh, but on the other hand, I think he's capable of and has made some good appointments. We should all... Uh, look, when, when his rhetoric is right, let's support that, and let's support the programs that would help to achieve that. And let's oppose the others, and and I because that's we're we're stuck with this guy, okay? 
And it's not clear that it, would, it wouldn't have been just as bad or worse if it had gone the other way, because we didn't have a good choice uh, in the United States. Usually, you can figure out the lesser of the two evils and vote for the lesser of the two evils. That was very hard to figure out this time. <laughs> OK, yeah. Gentleman to the, uh, with his hand up there. Keep. Yeah. Hi. Uh, which of the very popular economic theories do you think are shown to be least effective when tested with experiments? Popular economic... Which, yeah, which of the popular... Can you give an example of the sort yeah, of thing yeah, you I mean? Don't. Which of the popular economic theories is least... Of Supply and demand earlier, so... Okay. Anything like that, which is shown to be ineffective once tested. Okay. So, so supply and demand works like the blackboard suggests in the experiments. Mm -hmm. Is there anything which uh, you've discovered doesn't work like the blackboard suggests? It oh, yes. Be? Asset trading is a completely different animal. We first started in the early 80s. Uh, we've done a lot of extensions of, of these markets for perishables, uh, you see. And we, and, and we realized that, that the, the fact that these markets are so efficient uh, in the laboratory also helped you to understand why they were so stable out there in the world helped us to understand why deregulation in the Carter and, and administration was so spectacularly successful. What, it, what, what was it? They were all perishable services. We de deregulated the airlines. And then uh, after that was done, Darius Gaskins, who was on that board, moved over to the ICC, and he de deregulated uh, railroads and, and trucks, you see. And, but, but those are items, see, you buy an airline seat, it's to use it, it's not to resell it. And it's retrading. If, if you look at, at, at the sources of instability you see in national economies, it comes from, from the stuff that you can retrade, not the stuff that you can't. There's no problem with hamburgers, uh, haircuts, hotel rooms, and, and those kinds of commodities, and fortunately, they're 75% of, of private product. Are those goods? That's, that's what gives... Uh, that, those kinds of commodities that... Um, where the markets basically work well. I'm not saying there are no unanswered questions. There's a question of... Uh, with some commodities, whether they should be legal or not. There's, there are always questions of truth in labeling, truth in representation and in advertising, but, we, but that keeps being improved, you see. So those markets work fine. But then we, we started uh, to study asset trading in the 1980s in the lab, and we created a market where subjects had endowment of cash and shares, and the share paid a, a return at the end of each uh, period of trading, like a dividend. Okay, we gave people complete information on that, on that dividend and everything, so that it, it, on average the dividend, uh, a probabilistic, a probabilistic was say average was 24 cents, so, and there were going to be 15 periods of trading with a draw at the end of each period. So the, the first period had a fundamental value of 360. At the, uh, at the end of the first period, it just 14 draws left, so it's 14 times 24, so it's well-defined. Okay, our idea was to create a baseline where there would be no bubbles, all right? And then we we're going to see if we could create bubbles. That market bubbled, and we thought, what in the world is happening here? So <clears throat> we made sure people were understanding this environment. Uh, and we started to replicate those experiments. Inexperienced subjects always bubbled in that world. So I thought, well, you know, let, let me try corporate executives. Let me try small business persons. I had access to others. They bubbled too. In frustration, at one point, and it was in 1989, I went in and recruited a bunch of over-the-counter traders, Chicago traders, put them in an experiment. They gave me a great bubble. 
Now, if you bring people back a second time and a third time, they finally get it. <laughs> okay. But they have to, the point is uh, this true value, uh, they have to learn from experience that they better not. <clears throat> uh, uh, they better not buy at prices above that, and you better not sell at prices below that. But that's not a thinking process. That's a, that's a, a learning process through experience. And this is the reason why we, we learned here in the lab, you see, why it is that housing bubbles were such a problem. But, and we also learned how to, how to, in the lab, how to do away with those bubbles. It's very simple. It took us several years to discover this. When you pay the cash dividend, don't pay it back into the market in cash. Escrow that into an account and pay them at the end of the, of the, of the experiment. It was the new cash coming into the market that was fueling the bubble. Same thing in the United States in housing mortgage markets. When, when, new, when the flow of new mortgage credit into the housing industry is large and exceeds the rate of construction of new homes, that's an unsustainable world. That's what gives you, you see a bubble that, can, that, that cannot be sustained, there'll be a day of reckoning and there'll be a lot of damage from that. And the only way to, to really avoid the damage is to not get there in the first place. Okay, I'd just like to take a couple of questions from the gallery and then we'll have to wind up, I'm afraid. So, Gentleman at the front in the white shirt. So from what I'm hearing from your last question and one of the previous questions is, um, when the, obviously uh, with housing especially, as, uh, as there's more volatility from uh, a fixed rate, say, so from fixed loans, and then there's more demand in the market, um, it, you're essentially creating a bubble. And from what I'm seeing just around reading newspapers, et cetera, et cetera, is that same thing's happening in the London market now? So is the London housing market now at risk of a bubble? Well, I think uh, in, in the United States, I would say no. And we, that doesn't mean we don't have areas where the uh, markets are, uh, the housing prices are moving up much faster than in other areas. For, for example, in North Dakota, we had an oil boom, mm -hmm. okay? And this was in, out in the middle of nowhere, like this oil. And so you ha boom towns were created, and, and housing resources have to be pulled into that. And that creates a big, a big increase in prices. But those, that increased prices draws in resources and to satisfy that demand. And that needs to be distinguished, you see, from just a completely, I mean, a national general increase. And so you expect, you want credit to flow into those areas where there is a, a greater value associated with the creation of homes in those areas. And to some extent, you, you clearly have that uh, in other places around, around, the, around the world, and that is not necessarily a problem, okay? Okay, one more question from the gallery. Yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt. Um, so you spoke about your favorite 20th century economists, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your least favorite 20th century economists, the <laughs> economists you think have perhaps done the most damage in inhibiting prosperity. Well, I'm kind of reluctant to dump on some of my friends. <laughs> uh, I have... Uh, you know, I, I was never a very devout follower of Keynes, even though I had a great teacher at Harvard, uh, Alvin Hansen, probably the uh, best-known American Keynesian. And we loved Alvin Hansen. He was a great teacher. And, and <clears throat> what, one of the things we learned was that we were in for uh, a long period of of, uh, of pain after the Second World War. He said the markets would, we would return to that period of the Depression. He believed that it was a, 
it, it was a trend generally in the market and in and, and the economy, and that proved to be uh, qu uh, quite wrong. And so, uh, uh, so I've ne never found that very attractive, and I, uh, and I learned a lot of macroeconomics with my colleague uh, in, in, in writing our book for, the, for uh, Cambridge University Press, Rethinking Housing Bubbles. But what surprised me, a lot of things to Steve and I, who are an experimentalist and had this experience from the lab for, the, for these two kinds of markets, you see the stable ones and then the unstable ones and how that's connected to retrading. I found it uh, remarkable how uh, hard it was to get some of those ideas across in, uh, in among my uh, my peers in economics, because they just don't think that way, you see, whereas we found it very natural to, you see, to think in terms of, of, of what uh, is it about, a if a hypothesis fails, what is it about it that makes it fail, and, what, and what's the structure uh, that, that accounts for it? But do you find it strange that um, Marx has had so much influence, I mean, along the lines of, yes, I know he's been responsible for millions of deaths, but he had a point in what he was saying. Oh, well, it sounds good. I grew, listen, I grew up a socialist, and, and we were very much in, uh, uh, influenced by the ideas that, that somehow labor was not getting enough of the surplus, you see, and that this created efficiency mm -hmm. of demand. Those ideas, I grew up with them. And uh, the Amer interesting thing about the American socialist movement, though, th there were three things in it. One, they got completely wrong, the economics, but the other two, they had right. Uh, Norman Thomas, who was six times candidate for president on the American Socialist Party, was a, was a fervent advocate of First Amendment rights. He had founded the American Civil Liberties Union, okay? He had also been very active in the uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation. That is an anti-war, uh, long-time organization in the United States. And, and so, so that the Amer American socialists were very much skeptical of, of what they called American ad adventurism abroad, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. see. And I think a lot of that uh, they understood and they got right. What's amazing is, and they, oh, they opposed uh, uh, racial discrimination, all, f all mm. forms of discrimination. And, and so there was this, rec what's amazing is there's this recognition of the importance of social and political freedom, but not, they don't, why don't they naturally carry over that into economics? Mm -hmm. They didn't. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> well, Thank you. It's been wonderful to listen to your um, words of wisdom, to hear about everything from your, your views on Adam Smith to um, right up to date to Donald Trump and, and the London housing market. Thank you once again for coming to the IEA and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you.